Um, so I want to start uh, by doing a quick um, land acknowledgement um, before we get going. So uh, we are coming to you, or I am coming to you, from the ancestral, traditional, and unceded territory of the Piscataway and the Kochtank peoples. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to my co-facilitators to both introduce themselves and tell you where they are coming to us from. So yes, me. Thank you. And Cecily, do you want to say who you are to us as an organization? I will do that when you all are done. Perfect. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Yasmin Silva. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I am located in Harlem, New York, um, which is the territory of the Lenape peoples. Uh, and I am partnerships manager at Beyond the Bomb. So uh, if you're with coming to us from other organizations, uh, I would love to connect with you and learn more about what you do and how we can uplift each other's work. And I will pass it to Kathan. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Kathan Reddy. My pronouns are he, him, his. And I am coming to you guys from Columbus, Ohio, which is a uh, territory of the Hopewell and Kaskaskia peoples. And I am a future first fellow and I can pass it back to Cecily. Great, thanks so much. Um, so uh, my name is Cecily Thompson-Williams. I use she, her pronouns. I'm the executive director at Beyond the Bomb. And what we're gonna be doing today is uh, talking about Campaign Strategy 101. Um, and since I'm assuming that most of you who are joining us today have done some degree of campaigning, you know that you probably can't fit a full campaign strategy 101 into an hour and a half. Um, so we're going to work a little magic and try to fit as much of it in as we can. Um, but we wanted to be before we get going, we wanted to make sure that you know that our goal for this session is to get across a framework, the framework that we use for campaign strategy and some of those tools. Um, but recognizing that we won't have the time to go into a lot of detail, I actually teach this class and it's a full two day course that I teach. Um, so we're kind of massively convincing. Uh, so the point being, uh, our email addresses are here for a reason because we anticipate that we won't be able to get into as much detail as you might like. And we would love for you to follow up with us with any questions. The other thing I'd like to note is that I will be monitoring the chat. So as we're going, if you have questions, I can answer those in real time um, while Kate and Yasmin are presenting um, and vice versa. So please feel free to drop questions in the chat for clarification. Um, and with that, uh, I would like to go ahead and move forward. Uh, again, if you um, if you have uh, access to you know browser and you want to follow along in Mural on your own, the link is in the chat. Otherwise, you can obviously just follow this screen share. Um, so we're going to just start by giving you kind of an overview of the wrong thing. So let me come over here. The beauty of technology. All right. So I wanted to start um, by first of all, sort of introducing you to who we are, what this is, why we wanted to do this training. Um, so we are beyond the bomb. We're an organization that works on preventing nuclear war. And you're going to learn more about us through this. So I'm not going to say too much about who we are. We kind of use some of our campaigns as examples. Um, but we are also really very strict about utilizing a really comprehensive campaign strategy methodology, and it is central to how our organization operates. So with that, um, we wanted to share what we do. And before we get going, we wanted to just share a little bit about um, how, where this all kind of came from. So I've been doing campaign work for about 20 years. I've been trained on campaign work by a whole lot of trainers. Um, and this is kind of the synthesis of what I've learned and what I've learned from others um, and what others have shared with us. And then within Beyond the Bomb, how we've taken that and applied it. And so how our team has made adjustments in real time to make things work really well. Um, so, so the history, there's a lot of history there. That being said, everything is written in pencil because everything change, you know, things are changing in the campaign world on a regular basis. So we'd love, you know, feedback on ways that you think that this could be improved as a methodology. Um, and, you know, but, but that's kind of where things came from. So I'm going to go ahead and get started and just talking to you about some of the strategic considerations that we put in place before we get going with a campaign. So the first is that you can't be successful if you can't define victory. And this, this sounds kind of obvious, but unfortunately it's not. And we see a lot of campaigns out in the world that are you know, focused on 
uh, the nebulous public education um, without having a specific goal. Now, having a specific goal around public education is great, but if you don't really know exactly what you need to do um, or what you're trying to achieve, you, you can't achieve it. Um, the second one is that what we're about to teach you is an integrated philosophy of how to create change. It's not a checklist. So you're not going to get, you're not going to like leave this with, you know, 20 to do items to get to win. Um, but you are going to have, we hope, a philosophy that will allow you to approach any campaign um, with success. And then the last one is that hubris can exacerbate the problem that you're trying to solve. And so what I mean by this, and I think this is a really important lesson, um, is that very often change makers, um, and this is, I will say, I, the one thing I really love about being old <laughs> is that I've been able to see this really amazing transition in the sort of ethos of campaigning from a period of time when change makers really thought that they had all the answers to a period of time where engaging with impacted communities was much more important and central to the work. And, and that's what this is all about. Uh, it's that you can't pretend to know everything and you won't have all the answers. And um, that is a level of arrogance that has no place in change making. Um, and we wanna see you know, that collaboration and we wanna see all these different perspectives and particularly impacted communities represented. Um, and that leads us to what we call the solutions framework. Um, and so the solutions framework is really all about what do you need at the table in order to create a good campaign strategy. So this is like before you, you know, even start talking about your goals and your actions and your tactics and all that stuff, what their tweets are going to say, like way before all of that, you need this in place. And, and essentially this means when you're trying to put together your campaign team, you wanna have representation from all four of these categories. So you want people with different experiences, different, you know, different amounts and types of professional and personal experience. You want people who have different personal contexts. So again, looking at frontline communities, um, underrepresented communities, positions of privilege, you wanna have a, a diversity of that in the room different perspectives. So people who are bringing different priorities and have different interpretations of how the world works. Um, and then, you know, of course, different skills. So we wanna know uh, that we have folks who know how to organize and communicate and policy, but we also have fundraisers and people who are good at managing because just because you can do those other things doesn't mean that you're great with people. Um, so having all those things in place is really critical to building a successful campaign. Um, so that, that is the a foundation just in terms of building our team. And the next thing that I'm going to walk you through is our campaign strategy actual process. The whole rest of this training is built around this process. So this is foundational. You'll see in the uh, workbook that we gave you to download from SCAD and that's linked here. Um, you'll see uh, a copy of this so you can sort of reference it as we're moving around. Um, but we, the first thing I wanna stress about this model is that it is circular on purpose. There's no, there is no end point. There's a beginning, but there's no end. Um, and the reason for that is campaign work is inherently iterative. And you all probably know this, right? Like you, you, get, you get started on a campaign, you start to make some progress and either the progress that you make or you know, an election or what have you might change the landscape in which you're operating. And that may change the strategies that you need to bring to the table. So the process is essentially starting with understanding where are we now? So this top box right here or this top arrow is the first step. That's where you start your process. Really trying to get a clear understanding of who we are, what, what we have and what's happening out in the world. So we're gonna walk through more detail of what that looks like. Once you have that sense of where we are, then you can start figuring out where we're going. And I think a lot of campaigns tend to Sometimes we'll do this backwards. Well, they'll start with where are we going? Um, and then they'll come back to where are we now? Um, and that, that's not necessarily a wrong way to do it. There are lots of different ways. I like to start with where are we now? Um, because sometimes the contrast between where we are now and, and a big vision for the future can help to inform the building of, um, of what that future might look like. Uh, and further, during our where are we going stage is when we start talking about theory of change, the, the start, start to build some of those goals. Um, the third area is how can we change reality? And this is really all about getting into the nitty gritty. So at this point, we have our theory of change and we're looking at who are our targets, who are the other stakeholders, how do we get to them? How do we get them to do what we want? And then, so these are like three massive categories of work that all happen 
before the first tweet is sent. That all happened before you know you start figuring out what your tactics are, before you might send out fundraising proposals and the like. Um, so just something to bear in mind that this background work um, is really, that's the meat of campaign work. Uh, finally, you'll get to let's go, right? And this is all the fun stuff. This is like the stuff that probably brought you into the movement because you went to an action or you took an action or you got a phone call from somebody. Like that's all let's go stuff. And that's the really exciting stuff I think for a lot of people. And that's I think that's one of the reasons that we tend to sort of jump right there. Um, but that work is all so much more effective when we start with these other areas. Um, so we're gonna talk a little bit about that last area, but frankly, we think that that's the part that most people do the best. And so we don't spend as much time talking about that because it's where more, more people are familiar. We wanna get you grounded in the strategy and the, and the platform there. Um, so that covers the overview. Um, I wanna stop for just a second and see if anyone has questions. If you do have a question, you can either drop it in the chat or I think you can unmute yourself um, to ask the question, um, but I will just pause for a second and see if, if anyone drops anything in the chat. All right, um, I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to Yasmin, who's going to move on and start talking about how do you figure out where you are now. Perfect. Thanks so much, Cecily. Um, and so if you're following along um, yourself on the mural, you'll see that a new session section has just unlocked um, and that's SWAT. <laughs> um, so to start off with where are we now, it's really important to understand where you are situated either as an organization or a group of individuals who wants to make change. Uh, and so one of the best ways to do that is by looking at your strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Uh, and speaking personally, this can be really difficult. I know that if I'm ever asked in an interview to describe myself in like three phrases, or like, what are you really good at? Or where do you have room to improve? That can be a difficult thing to do, but I think it's so essential to understanding where your power comes from, where you can have more, what alliances you have to build, et cetera, to make sure that when you get to that let's go phase, you're ready to go. Um, so just wanted to, um, before we dive into each of these squares, um, just a note um, on participatory research and analysis on a whole um, at, at every point in this process, right? Um, is that those affected should be integrally involved in the research and the work that you're doing. Um, so you have to know who they are <laughs> and we're gonna get into that in a bit. Um, checking your assumptions at the door are really important. And again, when you're examining yourself or your organization or your group, um, kind of suspending those can be important to imagine what's possible and what really needs to be done. Um, and checking your understanding, not just at the beginning, but throughout the whole process. So I kind of wanted to ground as we kick off um, in, in those principles. So SWAT, what does it mean? How do we do it? So you'll see um, there's a grid here. Um, and on the top of the grid, uh, there are internal. So that is our strengths and our weaknesses. And so that's taking a look at um, your organization, your movement, your campaign, and internally, what do you have going on? And then external, um, opportunities and threats. So Cecily mentioned before that you might be in an election year. So that might change the landscape and that can either for what you're working on pose an opportunity or a threat. So those are the two main differences I would say um, within this as we're working this out. And um, I, I think the best way to, to show this is to use an example. Um, so I am going to use um, Beyond the Bomb as an example, because again, this can be a difficult process. Um, so seeing kind of what we've taken and done might help you all. So um, under strengths, um, some things for our team is we're committed and passionate. Uh, we have a strong commitment to strategy and planning. Obviously we <laughs> created this entire thing. Um, we're pretty good at rapid response, uh, which in the nuclear space is pretty critical when you have a former administration that was saying that they wanted to rain fire and fury down <laughs> on another country. 
Um, we have an understanding of the intersection of our issues. So we don't just look at nuclear weapons as this foreign policy issue or this siloed issue. We really think that it integrate, it intimately connects with a bunch of other movements um, and a willingness to get creative and try new things. But on the flip side, so internally for our weaknesses, there are funding limitations. Who doesn't have them? If you don't, bless you, I want, I want your funders. <laughs> Um, we are a very small team, and so obviously that can impact the amount of work that we can actually take on. And we're less known in the broader movement, so it's harder to get traction um, or people to listen sometimes. So those are all the internal things that when we look at ourselves as an organization. And then on the flip side, uh, or not the flip side, on the other side, we have external things. So those opportunities and threats. So for us, um, I actually, if you'll notice, I see I have something straddling the line here um, between internal and external opportunities. And I'll get to that in a second. I'm not forgetting about it. But um, nuclear weapons, so an opportunity for us is nuclear weapons are clearly linked in our mind to other progressive fights, which means that we have an opportunity to educate and expand and broaden our audience in that way. I think nowadays activists on the whole are more committed to intersectionality than ever, which again means that um, our job of educating um, and helping people take action is easier. Um, and the third opportunity is the previous administration really highlighted the urgency of our issue um, and gives us a foundation of knowledge. Um, oh my goodness, I am blowing through my time. I'm taking longer to go over this than I thought. Um, so, um, and third, or excuse me, and then on the other side, we have threats. So um, some threats, I think, for any movement, not just ours, is activist fatigue, right? We just went through a pretty arduous administration and we didn't get a lot done. But um, on the flip side, there's a lot of hope there, which we could put under opportunity. But um, other threats are people might have think that some threats went away when Trump left office. Um, and specifically in the nuclear space, there's a lack of alignment um, on, on priorities and what's important. And so that can threaten our effectiveness as a movement. And then going back to that, that little thing straddling the line um, between internal and external, between opportunities and strengths, um, we personally, beyond the bomb, can communicate our issue in ways that other orgs can't. So we're pretty snarky in our tone, we're irreverent, we call things as we see them, and not all organizations can do that. Um, and so that's an opportunity to bring in new people and also a strength of ours. So that's why I have it there. So you don't have to be so rigid with this grid, you can make it your own. And I wanna um, share that in the workbook that Cecily sent a link for, there is a, um, an opportunity for you to take this and use this and make it your own. I don't think I have time right now for us to go into the, the example that I was hoping to. Yeah, yeah, okay, great. Um, so I want us now, so if you're in the workbook, um, it would be great to just take five minutes um, for yourself to, to think through um, what the SWAT would look like for the campaign that you're working on or the organization that you're a part of. Um, again, this is kind of the foundational step one of where we see ourselves going. So I'm gonna set a timer here um, for five minutes uh, on the mural if you're on it. And just uh, going into that workbook that Cecily just relinked um, and thinking through what the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats for your organization, movement, or group are. Um, So while you're doing that, I'm just going to say two additional things. One is um, the biggest hang up that people have with this is the difference between internal and external, which is one of the reasons that we wanted to make sure to show you that one that kind of sits on the line. Um, and it's really important because the things that are internal, you have control over. You have the, the ability to you know, fundraise more. You have the ability to, you know, make sure that your staff is trained up in the way that you want them trained up, et cetera. Um, but the external stuff, that's stuff you have to work to influence. Um, and so it's really important that you have that, that kind of division clear in your mind. Um, and then the other, I'll, I'll just note really quickly is uh, we included, you know, just a limited number of post-its here when we did this in real life for our um, organization and campaigns. 
uh, it was absolutely completely jam filled with with post its in every quadrant and and that's good right like the more data that you have to really understand where you are now, the, the more effective your strategy is going to be. So we didn't want to bore you with our like hundreds of, of post-it notes, but that's, you know, that's where you're, you're sort of aiming for in the long run is to have that great of an understanding of, of your background. And we are open for questions. If folks have any questions, I don't know that we need maybe not the whole five minutes to do that, to do yeah. the activity. Yeah. All right, I'm going to stop the timer um, to give us back some time. Um, but yeah, if folks have questions, again, our emails are at the end. Um, and happy, happy to go over and, and talk with folks more after this, um, as you're going through that. So if we want to move forward. Great. So we are now moving into that next quadrant. Um, so we've kind of looked at where we're at and now we want to look at where we're going. So one step closer to getting going. Um, so we, the theory of change uh, is the backbone of, of strategy. And eventually your theory of change will guide decision-making and planning moving forward. Um, so it's, it's important to take the time for this step and it can be rather time consuming. Um, but remember that it's always written in pencil and, and to come back and adjust as necessary. This entire thing is written in pencil because it is an iterative circle. We, we are constantly learning and reviewing from what we're doing. So um, as you can see here, there is an arrow, um, an upward facing arrow. And along that arrow, there are um, different goals. Um, and at the very top of the arrow, there's a vision. So we actually like to kind of start backwards with that grand vision. Um, so what is your vision? Um, the vision is um, the affirmative, <laughs> Um, sentence and goal of what you're ultimately working for. If you as an organization for your campaign, whatever it is, like what is the end point that you want to see? So some questions to ask yourself um, as you're thinking through your vision um, is, is the vision aspirational? Is it written as a positive expression rather than a negative one? Again, I think we, we want to, when in change making work, we, we want to define the world on our own terms and see that positive change reflected, not a negative of, of what it shouldn't be. Um, and then is it relevant to the problem you are trying to solve? So again, all of these other goals and everything else that you'll be working on feeds up to that vision. So getting it to be um, an agreed upon concise vision um, and getting buy-in from everyone around that vision is important. So on your way to your vision, you're gonna to have to set a number of goals in order to get there because as much as I would like to see a world without nuclear weapons, I cannot snap my fingers and achieve that tomorrow. Although the world would be a better place with better funded healthcare and education and clean water and you know, all those great things. Um, so working backwards from your vision or what are, what are some of the ultimate goals that you would need to achieve to get to that vision? So um, are these clearly the path to your goals? Um, are they smarty goals? So I'm gonna pause for a hot minute um, and take you over to the right where we have smarty goals. So every goal that Beyond the Bomb sets is a smarty goal. And smarty uh, is just a framework um, to help you make sure that the goals you're setting are actually helpful towards achieving that vision. So it stands for strategic, measurable, ambitious, realistic, time-bound, inclusive, and equitable. And so if your, goal, if your goal that you're trying to set to get to your vision isn't smarty, you need to rethink your goal <laughs> to have it fit within the smarty framework. So um, for strategic, um, it reflects an important dimension of what your organization seeks to accomplish. Um, for measurable, it includes standards by which reasonable people can agree on whether or not the goal has been met. And this will be helpful when you're going through that process again to see if you achieved that goal and if it was effective and helped you get to that vision. Ambitious 
So is it challenging enough that the achievement would mean significant progress or a stretch for the organization? Um, staying safe and having wins is important, but it's also really important to be ambitious. Again, we are fighting for a world that has not yet been created. And in order to get there, we're gonna have to push the envelope a little bit. Um, realistic, so it's not so challenging as to indicate a lack of thought about resources or execution, or it's possible to track and worth the time and energy to do so. Um, and inclusive, um, does it bring in traditionally marginalized people, particularly those who are most impacted into processes, activities, and decision making in a way that shares power? And finally, is it equitable? Um, it includes an element of fairness or justice that seeks to address systemic injustice, inequity, or oppression. Um, and I think sometimes you might see this iterated as smart goals instead of smarty goals. For us, it's smarty is so important because when you're baking in inclusion and equity into the goals, you don't have to wonder if you as an organization are being inclusive and equitable because you know that every single goal you're setting is making sure that you are. So for us, that's that's really important. So on these ultimate goals, are they smarty? Um, and are they goals rather than actions? Um, oftentimes we can set a tactic and we think that that's a goal. Um, and that's an easy mistake to make. It's something that I still sometimes have to review and sit down, but, but tactics are how you achieve your goals and goals are the thing you want to achieve. So just making sure that there's a clear distinction there. So, and again, this is an arrow going up. So in order to get to your ultimate goals, you need to set some midterm goals. <laughs> um, so, the, so the ultimate goals are kind of the step right before your vision, midterm goals are more longer term and then near term actions are, are short. So for the midterm goals, are they long term and hefty goals? Are they also smarty? Um, and again, making sure that they're goals rather than actions or tactics. And then finally, near-term actions. So again, making sure these are actions, uh, excuse me, making sure um, they are, Cecily, did I type this wrong? No, these are actions. Yeah, they're actions, yeah. Perfect. At this point, you're trying to figure out what do you need to do to get started. Thank you, thank you. Um, <laughs> so um, these are actions rather than goals because these are short-term and achievable things that again, feed up into those goals. So we're, we're at the let's go stage. Um, are they necessary to achieve your goals? Um, so do they feed in upward into that arrow in the goals you set? And are they things you can do in the near term? So oftentimes we, we the way that we, we do this annually and obviously we, we come back and look at it pretty regularly, but I think um, a good way if you wanna get started to look at it is near term actions can be the next three months midterm goals can be six months, ultimate goals can be a year, and they all feed into that ultimate vision of what you stand for and what you're fighting for. Um, so that was a bunch again, <laughs> um, but I think it's easier to, to kind of see it out in action. And Cecily, can I get a time check? We have about 20 more minutes for theory of change. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Okay, so um, I wanted to, us to go through um, a campaign that Beyond the Bomb currently has, which is for no first use, and kind of show you what our theory of change was. And so you can see kind of those things in practice. So no first use is the campaign, but our vision, um, is a planet that has moved beyond the bomb. And for us, um, that means a bunch of things. <laughs> it means that governments invest in human needs over weapons of mass destruction, that cooperation and community are stronger forces than fear and violence, that the interests of citizens always come before corporations and businesses, that communities impacted by the nuclear system are recognized and delivered justice, and that nuclear weapons are forever consigned to the dustbin of history. So for us, um, in achieving that vision, we have identified that uh, if 
the United States implements a no first use policy, that is an ultimate goal that puts us on track to achieve that vision of a planet that has moved beyond the bomb. So as you'll see, that is under our ultimate goal is that it will be the policy of the United States not to engage in a nuclear first strike. Um, and for us, um, that we, we went through the process just over again to the right of SMARTY goals. So when we looked at that goal, it's strategic um, in making sure that um, it sets us on a pathway for a planet that has moved beyond the bomb. It's measurable, it's, it's a policy, so we can measure it on whether or not it's implemented. It's ambitious because right now um, there are a bunch of really deep pockets and powerful lawmakers who don't wanna see that happen. Um, but it is realistic because we, we know that um, this current administration, the Obama administration and other lawmakers have discussed it. It's been on the table. So we know that it's not completely outrageous. Um, in this case, we haven't included the time bound just because um, I didn't in this example, but we do have a time bound on our internal theory of change. Um, uh, it's inclusive because we are working um, with um, marginalized and impacted communities with Habaksha, um, with downwinders across the country um, in making sure that this helps feed into their vision of what the world is. Um, and we believe that it's equitable because um, if we're able to institute a no first use policy, um, it means that, I mean, in my mind, it sets us on a path for eliminating US imperialism as it exists <laughs> and the, the sort of Damocles that hangs over the world because of it. But you know, I'm, not, I'm gonna get off my soapbox about that because I could go on that one for a bit. Um, so that's our ultimate goal that again, helps us achieve our vision. Um, and and in, a, in a proper theory of change that wasn't just looking at one issue, we would have a few ultimate, like a, right, this one thing isn't gonna set us on like completely to um, eliminate nuclear weapons, but it's one piece of the puzzle. So in when you're doing this for yourself, um, that's why it's plural, ultimate goals. So midterm goals um, would be to establish champions in Congress that support no first use, um, position no first use to gain national relevance, um, and spark public demand for no first use. So obviously, if we establish champions in Congress, if we get media talking about this and other things, and we have a strong grassroots presence, all of that feeds up into making sure that that policy gets passed. And as you'll notice, our vision is kind of one sentence top line. Our ultimate goal is a bit expanded and we might have one or two there. And as we kind of get down the arrow closer to the base in those actions, we have more things that feed into that because things can become clearer as we, we get closer in time frame. So finally, those near-term actions. Um, so we want to build a targeted grassroots engagement plan. Um, we want to reach out to partner organizations and engage in coalition work. We're going to work with policymakers to build support and political cover. And finally, um, we will engage in rapid response on critical related issues. And so to go back to that, um, I can't, I can't go back to that, but <laughs> in the original um, thing you'll saw, so these are all actions. So these are all like actions that we will take that will feed into those midterm goals if properly executed. Those midterm goals will feed into that ultimate goal and that ultimate goal helps us achieve our vision. So that's why we have that arrow going up, but we work backwards because again, if we don't know where we're going, if we don't know where, where we wanna end up, we might end up with near-term actions that make no sense for the ultimate vision or might actually alter our alternate vision and, and, and bring us to somewhere that are not as close or, or not as, important in our minds if we had taken the time to really start with that ultimate 
vision and then work our way down. So I'll pause for a second for questions because I see the chat has, oh, okay, cool, cool. Thank you. Apologies on using that jargon. We actually, um, it's hard because we can't see your screens, but for, at Beyond the Bomb, we have a thing called jargon giraffe that if somebody says a phrase that you don't understand, you throw up your jargon giraffe and then I will explain. Um, so thank you to Cecily and Caitlin for, for doing that for me. Um, but are there any questions specifically on how, how this, how all of these things feed up into a vision and how starting with the vision is, is the important step. And, and another thing to say, it's important to have buy-in on this from everyone. Um, we at Beyond the Bomb and me especially, I am our partnerships manager. I use this model when I'm working in coalitions with people when we're setting goals for coalitions. And I think a place that we can often fall apart, especially when we might have different tactics or voices or, or goals even, we like, that are ultimate goals, but we're working together in coalition, having a united understanding of what our vision is means that at the end of the day, we are all thinking strategically about getting there. And so um, it's just really important to have buy-in um, and understanding from everyone on your team or group or coalition um, of what that vision is. Yes. Um, so, how much time? One second. Uh, you have about 10 more minutes. I'm just going to add one more thing or a couple of, of comments. Um, folks, if you have questions, please do drop them in the chat um, or we can take you off mute if you want to ask a question. Um, I just wanted to, to let you know a couple of things. One 